Hello everybody and welcome to the Continuing Healthcare Training uh, via a webinar. My name is Charlotte Wilson and I'm going to be your speaker today. Um, just got a few slides to go through, just some general information regarding the webinar and then we'll get to um, CHC funding. So yeah, like I've just said, welcome to the contact webinar. Um, if there is a technical hitch, please do bear with us. And those of you joining by PC, laptop, tablet or smartphone should now be able to see this introduction slide. Timings and questions. As there are so many attendees, um, as you can appreciate, it's not practical for verbal questions to be taken and therefore you will all remain muted throughout. If at any point you do have questions, please use the question icon on your GoToWebinar toolbar on your screen. This will allow you to type your question into the text box and submit this to the webinar administrator. I will select as many relevant questions to answer as time allows. If similar questions are received, I will condense these where possible. Q&A. Further relevant questions not covered in the time allowed will be answered and posted on the contact website along with a recording of this webinar details of which will be circulated next week. At the end of the webinar, a short questionnaire will launch. Please take the time to complete this as this will assist with future online training events. Brilliant, so we'll make a start. So, um, hello and welcome to this Continuing Healthcare webinar. This presentation aims to be a gentle overview of Continuing Healthcare funding in terms of what it is, the eligibility criteria and some information that might assist in terms of any appeals against funding decisions. Throughout the presentation, I will refer to the framework generally as CHC funding. I will split the presentation into three main sections and then, then as I've said before, there will hopefully be time for questions at the end. So to start, what is CHC funding? CHC funding is NHS arranged and funded packages of care for individuals over the age of 18. The main difference between an NHS continuing healthcare package and a local authority community care package is that there is no mean test applied, which means that as long as the eligibility criteria is met, it is free for the individual. If a person qualifies for CHC funding, then the package of care arranged will be funded by the NHS, and this will cover support for all of their health and social care needs, including any residential accommodation. However, CHC funded packages can be provided in all types of settings. A CHC funded package would cover an individual's assessed personal social care needs and health care needs, and costs such as help with washing, dressing, medication, continence care, skin care, therapies, and any other complex healthcare needs. I will aim to provide an overview of the assessment process, how eligibility is assessed, and what type of care a CHC package can provide. The main duties of the NHS in terms of providing CHC packages of care are found within the NHS Act 2006, as amended by the Health and Social Care Act 2012. This is supported by regulations to explain the duties within the legislation. There is also a framework document to support professionals and individuals through the process. I want to briefly mention a couple of key legal cases which are important background in terms of how the framework and policies relating to CHC funding were developed. I'm not planning to go into too much detail regarding these cases as I want to keep the presentation more practical in its nature. The full titles of the cases are at the top of the slide if you are interested in any further reading. The Coughlin case from 1999, although it started as a legal challenge in terms of Pamela Coughlin's care placement, the case also raised legal points about the responsibilities of health authorities and local authorities in terms of meeting the needs of individuals in their local areas. The Coughlin case confirmed that where an individual's primary need is a health need, 
the responsibility to meet that need is that of the NHS, even when an individual has been placed in a home by the local authority. The Court of Appeal judgment heavily influenced the development of CHC policies and the national framework previously referred to. Just to note, pieces of legislation have come into force post the decision in the Coughlin case. However, it is still very relevant to the CHC framework that the NHS uses today. This second case, the case of Grogan from 2006, is also an influential case in this area in terms of looking to challenge any decision of a particular NHS authority. This case looked at whether the eligibility criteria more in Grogan was assessed against was contrary to the outcome of the Coughlin case. There were several key relevant points arising out of this case. The first being that this particular trust did not have in place and did not apply criteria which properly identified the test or approach to be followed in deciding whether Maureen's primary health need was a health need. The court identified that there could be an overlap or indeed a gap between social care and NHS provision depending on the test or tests to be applied. As a result, this has been a challenge for individuals in terms of applying criteria to their own situation in terms of identifying whether they have a primary health need. So where has this legal landscape taken us? So when it comes to the assessment of eligibility for CHC funding, what is the criteria? The difficulty is that the primary health need is not defined by the legislation. Eligibility is therefore determined by professionals such as doctors, nurses or social workers. Funding can be applied for by speaking to a professional involved in the individual's care in the first instance or a friend or relative could also apply on their behalf. It will very much depend on how the individual presents and what their needs are at the time of the assessment or what their needs may be in the near future. The local clinical commissioning group will have a team of professionals of different disciplines who will be involved in the assessment process. These professionals will look at the full extent of the individual's needs and decide whether overall there is a primary health need. It is very important to know that the assessment is based on needs rather than a particular diagnosis. An example of this is that not every individual diagnosed with, for example, autism or dementia will be automatically eligible for funding. The individual's needs would need to be intense, complex or unpredictable, amongst other factors that I will go on to. The team will assess the person's needs and then make a recommendation. It's then the clinical commissioning group that will decide whether to award the funding. It is therefore important to ensure that steps are taken to start the assessment process as soon as it is thought that CHC funding may be appropriate because this will ensure that decision is made as soon as possible. So when there is an indication that an individual's needs may be more than the local authority could be expected to provide in terms of social care, the assessment process will commence once a request for an assessment has been made. The flowchart on the presentation screen provides a very simple guide to the assessment process and the next steps in terms of finding an, uh, in terms of finding an eligibility or an eligibility decision. The first step before the main assessment, known as the decision sport tool on the screen, is for there to be an initial determination via the checklist, which is the box at the top of the slide. The checklist can be undertaken either in hospital, at home or another care setting and is undertaken by an appropriate professional. The checklist will be a general assessment of the individual's health and care needs in terms of the following list and just I'd like to point out that this list is included in a future slide in case anybody is taking any additional notes. So the assessor will look at the person's behaviour, cognition, psychological needs, communication, 
mobility, nutrition, continence, skin, breathing, medication, and al altered states of consciousness, e.g. if somebody suffers with epilepsy. The assessment will also look at any other significant care needs that don't easily fit into the categories I've just described. If the checklist indicates that a person may have needs in those areas, this will trigger the full assessment underneath, as noted, the decision support tool. That will then determine the extent of those needs. A point to note um, is that the initial screen in the checklist can be avoided if the individual's needs are deteriorating rapidly and a full assessment or determination of eligibility is required quickly. So, for example, when someone's um, at an end of life stage. In terms of assessing a claim for CHC funding, as I previously mentioned, the presenting needs would need to be more than social care needs. The assessment is based on the overall picture of needs rather than a particular medical condition. And the assessment will take place with reference to the domains that I just listed, plus four extra key indicators that I will expand on shortly. On the screen, you should be able to see the domains I previously referred to with letters across the top, P, S, H, M, L, N. These letters refer to how high or the severity of the level of need. So P is priority, S is severe, H is high, M is moderate, L is low, and N stands for no need. The areas marked in black are where the framework doesn't accept that an assessment of a particular level of a particular need. Um, so what I mean here is that it's so that the bar is not set too high. For example, when it comes to communication, the highest level that the person would need to reach is high. And that is described within the framework as someone being unable to reliably communicate their needs at any time in any way even when all practical steps to assist them have been taken. It goes on to say the person has to have most of their needs anticipated because of their inability to communicate them. So obviously that's um, a quite severe communication difficulty. So it only has to go as far as that to be at the top level of need in that area. Um, in terms of finding out a bit more about these particular areas, Yes, and the assessment of those and, and what would be a priority need to behave, for example. You can do um, searches online and find copies of the um, checklist and decision support tool documents that the NHS use. And you can see how the assessments are completed and accompanying guidance notes. Um, when undertaking the assessment, the assessor should speak to the individual, family, friends, observe the care interventions being given and also review um, notes of care um, if available. I previously mentioned the four key indicators which will be considered as well as scoring the needs as per the previous slide. So in addition the assessor will be looking at the nature, intensity, complexity and unpredictability of the needs. So I'm going to take some time to go through this to set out on the slide. So nature, this describes the particular characteristics of an individual's need, which can include physical needs, mental health needs or psychological needs, and the type of those needs. This also describes the overall effect of those needs on the individual, including the type, quality of interventions required to manage them. So that's the nature of the needs. Intensity, this relates both to the extent, so how often that need needs to be met, and the severity, so the degree, how hard is it to meet that need, and the support required to meet the need. Complexity, this is concerned with how the needs present and interact to increase the skill required to monitor the symptoms, 
treat the conditions and man manage the care. So, for example, how many um, care staff are required to, to undertake a particular task. So this may arise with a single condition or could include the presence of multiple conditions or the interaction between two or more conditions. So you may have um, an elderly person who has dementia but also has some physical health problems. It may also include situations where an individual's response to their own condition has an impact on their overall need, such as where a physical health need results in the individual developing a mental health need. So it's about how all the different needs interact with each other rather than just focusing on a diagnosis. So the last indicator is unpredictability. This describes the degree to which needs fluctuate and thereby create challenges in managing them for the professionals involved. It also relates to the level of risk to the person's health if adequate and timely care is not provided. Someone with unpredictable health care is likely to have a fluctuating, unstable or rapidly deteriorating condition. So when the assessment has taken place, how will eligibility be determined? Obviously, it is um, based on the facts of each individual case and a decision will always be taken on a case by case basis. However, in general terms, a good indicator of being eligible for CHC funding is when, when an individual has been identified as having one priority need, two plus severe needs, or perhaps one severe need with other needs of a high or moderate nature or a number of domains with high or moderate needs. So obviously it, it, it can be that there's vast cases where um, eligibility criteria is met and it really does depend on the individual and their needs and that particular assessment. There's no sort of one size fits all when it comes to determining um, eligibility. So if the individual has been subject to the assessment process, and the outcome is that CHC funding is awarded and that that's great news and a package can be implemented, a suitable care plan devised, look at whether there is a personal health budget to be implemented and of course with anything really it will be subject to review and continual reassessment um, to make sure that the care package is meeting that person's needs. But what if there is a finding of ineligibility? then there is a right of appeal and the stages of the claim can be found on slide 14 of the presentation where we went through the different steps to determine eligibility. So that is set out, but I will go through them um, now as well. So in summary, there are three stages to an appeal. There's a local resolution procedure. If that doesn't work, there's then a referral to the independent review panel. And then if, if that still doesn't resolve the dispute, then there could be a referral to the parliamentary ombudsman. So local resolution is the first step. The individual or a representative helping them will need to write to the assessor or the decision maker within the CHC and explain why they don't agree with that decision and a meeting may be offered at that stage. If that local resolution process doesn't change the decision or resolve any disagreement, and um, in my experience, it, it, it often doesn't really change the decision of the decision maker, then there may need to be an independent review panel consideration. So that's at regional level, so it gets stepped up and gets independent members of that particular local authority involved. Again, if that doesn't succeed in finding a, um, an eligibility decision or resolving the dispute generally, then the person or their representative can obviously take that further via a complaint to the parliamentary ombudsman, which is obviously appealing the decision at a national level. In terms of a deadline, the deadline is 
six months from the date that the original decision not to award CHC funding sorry, was made. There's been some discussion over recent years about which retrospective appeals in terms of um, years where someone may have been paying for their care when they should have reasonably been assessed and awarded CHC funding. Um, and my view on that is that uh, it may be necessary to seek advice on that point because there are um, date ranges where appeals are no longer um, allowed to be brought for retrospective appeals. Um, and there were deadlines in 2012 and 2013. So um, it, it might be wise to seek some advice around that if you're thinking of challenging um, something more historic. Some factors to consider when you are thinking of bringing an appeal of any decision is whether the assessment has considered the totality of the individual's need or any reoccurring health problems that may not be in evidence at the time of the assessment but weren't reasonably um, considered. Also, you could consider whether needs have changed quickly or recently or whether there may have been a period of time where the individual may have been eligible even if they're not now. So obviously it's a, it's a fluctuating process as, as a person's needs fluctuate and their eligibility may fluctuate as well. Another option if the individual is not found to be eligible for CHC funding and they reside in a nursing home, the decision support tool, so the assessment that's undertaken could as an alternative, indicate eligibility for NHS funded nursing care. So this is a contribution from the NHS to the cost of the care in the care home. This is provided by a registered nurse, so just one aspect of the care plan. But this could have an impact on how much the individual may then have to contribute to the cost of their social care package if that's applicable to their situation. So when it comes to challenging any decision, i um, just got a few tips and hints for doing that. So whether the appeal is at the local initial stage or higher national level, the individual will need to ensure that there's reasoning behind um, any challenge. When it comes to written submissions to show where you're saying the assessor got it wrong, these should be made in a clear and concise way, where possible, made from a medical point of view. And are there any um, medical clinician letters or reports that could be referred to where you've got uh, another professional support in a particular level of need or, or similar? Submissions should be structured. And in my view, I think a good way is to focus on one domain at a time. So um, communication, medication, and work in sub paragraphs that way. If you can quote from any records to support what you're saying oh, and expand on the nature, intensity, complexity, and unpredictability of the needs. And um, this you may find is a useful tool in terms of really thinking through what parts of the assessment you agree with and which parts you don't, rather than sort of a blanket. Um, challenge the entire assessment. If when you're thinking of doing an appeal there is a lawyer involved or you are seeking legal advice they may provide advice regarding whether obtaining an expert opinion would be useful and um, some potential cases might be where it's very borderline and just to get that bit of extra support from um, a medical professional might assist or in the situations where there are rare conditions or interaction of multiple conditions. So the individual situation is not straightforward at all um, and it's quite complex. So some further considerations when appeals are being made is um, whether or not the individual has been assessed as requiring funding nursing care, which touched upon previously, which is where there is a contribution to the nurse-led care and their package. Um, it's, as the slide says, it's not determinative, but it could indicate
indicate a level of need in that particular area where that nursing care is required. Look through any contradictions in the assessment where one thing said by the assessor in one domain, but that doesn't quite match up with what's said in another area and see if there's any inaccuracies in that respect. And always remember that well-managed needs are still needs. So um, just because somebody is able to have their needs well supported and having them met um, in a way that's best for them doesn't necessarily mean um, they're not eligible for CHC. Um, I would also say um, to consider acknowledging in your appeal um, submissions when an assessed level of need is agreed. So you may not necessarily disagree with the outcome of the entire assessment, only challenge the needs where there is evidence to support your view and that that might be um, a, a tool in terms of get, sort of getting the professional who you're trying to convince have got, has got it wrong to sort of come along with your way of thinking. Don't forget as well any additional needs that don't fit into the um, generic assessment domains. There is um, an, any other needs section and um, so that's the time to say when there's any part of the package that hasn't been assessed um, a, a, cer a certain care intervention that the person needs that doesn't directly relate to their communication or um, cognition, that kind of thing. And when you are making your submissions, um, it's, it's the time to have your say. So if there's been a particular lack of consultation in one area or with um, members of the family or friends or any um, informal carers, and this is the time to say where the assessment hasn't reflected what those individuals could offer to the assessment process or um, when they haven't been consulted at all. Um, I think as well remember that CHC funding assessments are not static so if there's an assessment of ineligibility in one month but then the individual's needs change then another checklist should be undertaken another assessment request made Likewise, there could be reviews in the future where a person eligible for CHC is no longer eligible to due to change needs. And an example of that is where their particular condition worsens and the needs are then easier to manage and therefore you're looking at your complexity, severity, that kind of thing. Okay, so um, that's my whistle stop tour of CHC in terms of the eligibility criteria. Um, how the assessments are undertaken, what CHC is for adults, and also some tips in terms of making submissions and appealing any decisions. So now we've got time for questions. I'm just going to take a moment to have a look at the questions that have been sent through um, the, from the administrator um, and to answer those. Okay, so we've got um, a question um age limit for CHC and can children be eligible for CHC and I did prepare a little bit in reply to that question because I did preempt that there may be questions relating to this due to the nature of contact support with the public so um yep there is um it's called continuing care for children so slightly different um, terminology and any child or young person up to their 18th birthday who has a complex health need may be eligible. When a young person reaches 18, then the adult NHS continuing healthcare arrangements apply. Um, what I will say is the significant differences between children and young people's continuing care and then the NHS continuing healthcare for adults. Although um, a child or a young person may be in receipt of a package of continuing care um, across their childhood, they may not be eligible for the NHS continuing health care. Um, and what will happen is usually the CCG will assess the young person in receipt of continuing care when they are 16 and 17 to see if they're likely to be eligible for NHS continuing health care when they turn 18. 
So although the assessment processes are very similar in terms of the checklists and the decision support tool, the criteria um, are very different and um, therefore just because a child receives a continuing care package in their adolescence, that doesn't necessarily mean that they will be eligible as an adult. Again, it's just subject to assessment of the needs at that time. So just going to um, have a look for the next question that I've received. So I'm just going to skip back to through the presentation to the slide that has the domains and the question about whether eligibility is one thing off that list or all of them and um, it could be one thing off the list that determines um, that a person is eligible for CHC if they've been assessed as having a priority need in that area but it's usually a combination of different needs and um, but like I say it's a case-by-case -case basis so there could be a situation where um, behaviour for example is a priority need and um, although it's probably likely that there would not be any needs in all of the other areas underneath it could happen but as I've stated on the scoring slide one priority need could in itself um, ensure that somebody is eligible for um, CHC funding. My experience through the work that I've done, it's usually an interaction of more than one area. And there are there are cases where somebody will have no needs in areas, but I, I usually see probably about no less than three areas where there's a scoring of some level of need. Hopefully that answers that question. So, and is there any legislation regarding the appeals process for children? Um, all I, what I would say is that um, CHC for adults is sort of my specialist area, but I would imagine that the appeals process is very similar for children and um, with a local resolution um, and that, um, then it gets stepped up to regional and then gets stepped up again to the ombudsman. But um, as I um, previously indicated, there, are, there is an opportunity to follow up for follow up questions and I can put some more information when the webinar is um, presented on the website in relation to that particular question and just um, indicate where there are any changes in terms of the appeals process for children. But um, I, I, I think it's going to be the same as the adult appeals process, given that the assessment process is similar. It's just how the needs are assessed that's the difference between adults and children. Okay, well, um, I've answered the questions that have been sent through during the presentation, um, but there will be um, an opportunity to ask follow-up questions once you've had a time to reflect on the discussion and I'm obviously more than happy to, to answer any of those questions. So it's just an opportunity now for me to say thank you for attending with us today and um, a short questionnaire will launch at the end of the webinar. Um, and hopefully you can please take the time to complete this as it will help us plan future online training events, including any topics you would like to see. And um, as I've stated, the recording of this webinar um, presentation and questions will be on the parent participation resources page of Contact's website. That'll be next week. And an email confirming this will be sent to you once this is available. Thank you.